Welcome, my name is Christoph Mauch, I'm the uh, director of the Virtual Carson Center and together with my colleague Dr. Gesa Lüdecke, who is the director of graduate programs, I'm very happy to welcome you to our Tuesday discussion today. This is Josh Bodak. Hello. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating this discussion today. We alternate next week, it's Gesa again. Um, it's wonderful to have you here, Josh. We've met before uh, a couple of times in Madison, Wisconsin at one point. And um, even though we've met before, I have to say that it's not easy to explain who is sitting here because uh, Josh is not just one thing, it's not, he's not easy, he doesn't fit into a box. He is many things at the same time. Um, comes from Australia to us, from Western Sydney, even though he doesn't really come from Australia because originally he comes from Britain and his parents left Britain at a point when some other people left Britain as well, when Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister. <laughs> um, but, uh, so he comes from Australia, but then also he doesn't really come from Australia right now because he comes from other European places. And he just told me which places this have been, and I, I thought I know every center in the field of environmental humanities, but I don't. He's been to 23 so far. This is number 24. <laughs> And next week you'll be in Cologne, it's the last one. So he's been traveling for, for three months, visiting many places in Germany, in Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and I was really impressed to do this. So he's not, um, he's in Australia, but also in Europe, he's British and Australian, and at the same time, um, what he's doing doesn't fit in a box. He started out uh, almost like a little Mozart uh, when he was, whoops, when he was uh, little. Uh, already he played the cello at five. I, I, mean, imagine, I imagine people who play cello at five, I mean the cello must have been taller than you. <laughs> or did you have a micro cello? They start, uh, you, start you out on a, a Kleenex tissue box and a, and a ruler. Just oh, a physical this is so area. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. So, uh, and he was always interested in the arts, uh, music for once, he always loved painting, he went to art school but didn't think it was the right thing, he went to law school but didn't think it was the right thing, then he found anthropology, uh, and he did his PhD in anthropology, but uh, it was not a typical PhD in anthropology, it was a PhD that was on one hand art, and on the other hand it was a, a media, uh, I mean it was, was scholarly work, and uh, he's not even... Uh, He's a humanities scholar. I think he would call himself a humanities scholar, but he's also trying to bring sciences and the humanities in a dialogue. And if you look at his website, if I remember right, there are three things uh, that, uh, that you're focusing on. One is techno science conservation. And so he looks at uh, you know, conservation through technology in the, Grand, in the Great Barrier Reef and in, in the coral reefs of Australia. The second thing uh, is MAD, I mean, not that you're MAD, but it's MAD is, uh, you, some of you know the ab ab abbreviation MAD, M-A-D, that's Music, Arts and Design. So that's, uh, that's a... Originally a, a mutually assured destruction. Similar, similar. And the third thing is something that uh, his upcoming book will be called, it's called Petrified, and Petrified uh, means really, I mean, the, 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 the arts project is also something that has to do with, you know, environmental anxiety in, the, uh, in this climate crisis. So uh, you, uh, what can art do in, in a, in a, in a, during the climate crisis? How can it move us? Or, uh, but also, how does it frighten us? And petrified, the meaning of the word, uh, for once means, you know, something becomes stone that was alive before, but it also means that we become stoned and petrified and shocked about what's happening to us. So I'm really intrigued by all this, and I will just uh, say, uh, when we talked, he uh, just just told me, um, I don't want to, uh, normally in, in America you always say show uh, and tell, but he says show, don't tell, so show, that's what we're going to hear from you, the show, the Josh Water show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to hear this last remark. Over the last few months, uh, I asked him what intrigued you, and he said, um, 
comes from a very atheistic household, but I never went to church. But he went to churches in Europe and uh, doesn't understand a word of what they're saying, but he really loves the music. Maybe that goes back to your cello in your file. Anyways, I'm totally intrigued. Uh, you're going to talk about ruptures, about uh, a dam. I know nothing about it. Join me in welcoming Josh Water. Um, thank you, Christoph. It's a gen genuinely uh, lovely introduction and, and definitely very bespoke. Um, I'll just uh, jump straight in, and uh, this will go about 10, 11 minutes, so should hopefully leave plenty of time for Q&A, and also thank you for coming on this day when your incredible river is so close and tempting and cool and refreshing nearby. Um, so essentially, I'm just going to read out um, one scene from this book I recently completed. The scene is called, in the book, is called This Is Not A Pipe Dream, but uh, I've given it a more um, prosaic title, and it's from a chapter called A Brief History of Running Out of Time. Just to give you a one minute summary of the book, essentially this is the topic which is by the human geographer Nigel Clark, a paragraph in the, in the uh, something of great relevance to Rachel Carson Center, the journal, journey, journal Theory, Culture and Society, where it says, what are, we to make, what are we to make of abrupt climate change now that academic science, popular science writing and Hollywood cinema have all warmed to the idea of sudden threshold transitions in climate systems, the issue is unlikely to recede. We've also passed the point at which progressive social thought can content itself by keeping a critical distance from the substantive claims of the natural sciences and entered a situation which cries out for a degree of fidelity to events unfolding around us, which would seem to me to imply at least provisional commitment to an idea of how our physical world actually works. And his gamble with the usual provisos about decision making under conditions of unknowability is that we must front up to the past reality and future likelihood of crossing climate thresholds. That's essentially the topic of the book. But the three acts of the book are mapped onto this one scene that most of you are familiar with from um, the Blade Runner, the Desert Turtle scene, and essentially uh, trying to look at this uh, way that you can use uh, poetics and storytelling and things from popular culture to get at things such, of, such as the Journal of Theory, Culture and Society, which might not be more accessible to outside the academy. So let's just jump straight in. Here's a pa quote from the same article by Nigel Clark, which is framing what I'm about to present to you. He's asking us, are we ready to be true to conditions and processes that threaten a radical undoing of the human capacity for collective action, to seek fidelity to a story that puts the cataclysm upstream of our humanity and not simply downstream where we can still dream of diversion and escape? So, this is not a pipe dream. The Tigris and Euphrates are the two great rivers of Mesopotamia and between them constitute one of the proverbial cradles of civilization. The details of where and when civilization first emerged have been lost to time. Only fragments remain. Though the valley between the two rivers is a mighty fragment and, mythical origins aside, has witnessed the rise and fall of many an empire. The city of Mosul, one of the oldest in the world, stands on the banks of the Tigris, 50 kilometers downstream from Mosul Dam. The dam's in design, engineering and construction involved an exceptional trade-off between resources and risk. Um, leaving not only Mosul, but also all other major downstream cities, such as Baghdad, at the behest of a 110-metre wall of water held back by a 113-metre wall of cement. The particulars of the geology literally undermined the dam no sooner the construction was completed in 1986. It has since provided the city with hydroelectricity and irrigation for the arid desert surrounds. Having hitched the city to the dam, the sunk costs have required constant injections of materials ever since, to shore up leaks and to reinforce the base. Following more than a decade of alarming reports, in 2016, a team of Iraqi and Swedish geologists and engineers published an article titled, The Mystery of Mosul Dam, the Most Dangerous Dam in the World, Dam Failure and Its Consequences. Co-authored by some of the original dam engineers, including the former chief engineer, Nasrat Adamo, the article sought greater certainty about the probability of dam collapse through refined modeling. While the word mystery is never mentioned other than in the title, Adama elaborated on this mystery in a Guardian article titled Mosul Dam Engineers Warn It Could Fail at Any Time, Killing One Million People. Therein, Adamo concluded that nobody knows when it will fail. It could be a year from now, it could be tomorrow. In light of the report, Iraq's Prime Minister, Haider al-Abadi, and the US Embassy in Baghdad issued statements on the perceived state of heightened risk obfuscating the inability to attend or alleviate the risks for those downstream of the potential cataclysm. 
For those downstream, bursting the bubble of civilization is a mere metaphor for many, but for those downstream from Mosul, it is a literal everyday affair. For those already downstream, beyond where we can dream of diversion and escape to reprise Nigel Clark, the human scale cataclysm is a literal affair that may eventuate, quote, a year from now, or, quote, it could be tomorrow, even if it still appears as a metaphor for those who believe themselves to live upstream of the dam wall. The dam cannot be comprehensively strengthened while the water is within, for how could the wall be accessed? The dam cannot be drained, for where would the water go while the wall is repaired or rebuilt? And even if it could be drained, where will the cities and farmlands get their water meanwhile? And where would the water come from to refill an empty dam? Neighbouring countries are not prone to letting precious water leave their borders. The dam cannot be deconstructed. In a society no longer used to such standards of living, a city with water tanks on every rooftop does not a habitable city make. The cities cannot be permanently evacuated, for where do cities go when there is no available land to be moved to? The concrete cannot be coaxed into stronger tensegrity. What was laid down is literally set in stone. The laws of geology cannot be muted because they are immutable. Strata will compose and recompose just as plate tectonics play out, irrespective of activity on Earth's surface. The laws of chemistry cannot be muted because they are immutable. Water will dissolve concrete foundations just as it does the cast bedrock beneath. The laws of physics cannot be muted because they are immutable. The wall of water will exert its pressure come ruin, revelry or revolution. The language of law, liability, regulation and policy can only mask the cracks for so long. Once they are visible to the naked eye of the lay person, the Kafkaesque theatricality of modern bureaucracy is laid bare, just like the naked emperor's body in the emperor's new clothes. The chasm between known unknowns and known knowns about whether one's world will collapse, quote, tomorrow or, quote, a year from now, is what sociologist Ulrich Beck termed a risk society in 1986, the same year Mosul Dam was completed. Industrial civilization lives in the shadows of existential risks inherited from the past, whether a dam wall, mutually assured destruction nuclear deterrence policy, or human-induced climate change. And these risks only compound all those unknown unknowns residing in the cataclysm upstream of humanity. The dam, the bomb, and the changed climate have already been brought into the world. Critiquing the myopia that gave rise to such short-sighted choices is as futile as trying to revise history. It does not yield a lesson for how to do things better next time round, for there is not going to be another next time during which a civilization will notionally get it right. Just as F. Scott Fitzgerald declared that there are no second acts in American lives, there are no second acts in the unfolding rupture. There is only the dam as it stands, an edifice crumbling at the seams, plugged with thumbtack level solutions, where each thumbtack pushed in presses the dam water to find another passage through the cancerous concrete. There is only the world as it stands, today, and the cataclysmic tomorrow that could come, quote, a year from now or in the morning. Trade-offs between today and tomorrow are one and the same as between resources and risk. Should you bank on strength X to withstand force Y over time period Z? And what when force Y has deviations both standard and stochastic? To live in the risk society is to live on the volcano of civilization, wherein we build houses to create the illusion of stability and safety, despite the fact that we are building on the back of a fundamentally unstable world turtle into whose working we have thrown our sticks, stones, and radioactive waste, thus rendering something unstable, unstable, completely volatile. Mosul Dam is an obvious candidate for, for a volcanically hitched civilization, the result of deliberate human intervention based on false conceptions of the stability of the rock beneath our feet and our own capacity for control and regulation, now, yieldi now yielding a precarious, unpredictable, and cataclysmic entity to come crashing down, quote, a year from now, or, quote, tomorrow. Yet even if all societies, ancient, modern, and industrial, were pitched on a volcano of some sort or another, we cannot acquit ourselves simply by claiming we perched our civilization on a volcano. This mistakes the smoke for the fossilized trees of Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. Civilization is also the volcano that has exacerbated the planet's intrinsic volatility and enhance its destructive potential via its civilized means of production. 
exhuming energy and heat from the subsurface of Earth, civilization has acted like a volcano, drawing up and combusting fossil fuels to channel the heat and energy into the atmosphere. The exhausted human-made mines are sibling to the volcano caldera left behind after an eruption, once the volcano's contents have erupted into the atmosphere. In a walnut shell, civilization manifests existential risks which are self-manufactured. All civilizations have existed perched atop a volcano, courtesy of the cosmic vicissitudes to which all life is behest. But only the present civilization is perched atop a volcano, and is a volcano itself too. The difference lies in what precepts and conceits have been inherited from when civilizations did not build dams, only to live in fear in their shadow, but whose houses, built more feebly on the earth, were nonetheless a trade-off between resources and risk. Singular instances of a contemporary Iraqi dam or an historical Indonesian lighthouse may appear poor proxies for cautions about climate change risks played by nation-state gamblers. They only appear impoverished because both are proximal. One dam collapse or tsunami and the rest of the show soldiers on. As distal phenomena, ruptures are inexorably more complex, as are their spatial and temporal repercussions. Only a rupture ends the world and begins in turning it anew as per planetary scale consequences and evolutionary scale changeability. Differentiating between proximal and distal phenomena has a bearing on our present tense, because moments that have repercussions for the entire planet beg their distinction. We act in the proximal, just as we live in it. It is how the world is mediated. The proximal is literally only ever right here and right now, wherever and whenever those happen to be. But the cumulative effects of collective human action extend to the realm of the distal, Despite this, the dominant worldview regards the dilemma as a proximal one, thus only encompassing the most obvious and ins instantaneous with scant regard for the insidious. Instead, we've been asked to live in the distal, given it is the domain we invited ourselves to play in. Beck describes the precarity of so doing in his risk society thesis as living on the volcano of civilization, the contours of the risk society. This title for the first part of his thesis features a heading of dealing with insecurity an essential qualification when Beck asks somewhat rhetorically, how can we live on the volcano of civilization without deliberately forgetting about it, without also suffocating on the fears and not just on the vapors that the volcano exudes? Given that all forms of shelter just continually reveal their hollow conceits, the answer to how we can live on the volcano can only come from radically new notions of expectations, of risk, of danger, of predictability, of probability, of periodicity, and most importantly, of tomorrow and all subsequent tomorrows to come. Thank you.